Confederacy of Mainland Mi'kmaq. So I'm going to give you a, a greeting in my language, and I'll explain what I said. Kwe means hello in Mi'kmaq. Chilasuk tukum sit no kumak. Well, dasi pibani me a chikwadin and nida wakanin. Sa unu te te mu dijik. Aksak nida buddha oteska. Kiloi mo kiskuk me gamagi. A well dasi dantesi or bejidaya would well ag. Diggly Gwe Gusset. Gwe in my language, as I mentioned, is hello. Bejilasuktig means welcome. It's an honor and a privilege and a pleasure for me to open up this lecture series of my dear friend, Peter Ernick. I welcome all of you to Migamagi, unceded Migamag territory. So thank you very much for the size of the audience here tonight on behalf of my dear friend, Peter. I'm just gonna, that's about all I'm gonna say. I'm just a <laughs> <coughs> <laughs> So I'm gonna pass it on to, I think you said Carolyn or the uh, Mr. President. So thank you very much, and I'm glad that so many are here tonight. Thank you very much. Let me get you, you, pin it Let me get you hooked up a little bit. I'm all sums too. No, that's okay. Okay. Good. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, Don, for being here and for uh, welcoming uh, welcoming us to uh, to Mi'kma'ki. My name is Peter Ricketts. I'm the uh, president and vice chancellor here at Acadia University. Great pleasure to welcome you all. Uh, it is indeed wonderful to see uh, so many people here uh, from from Acadia. I see students and faculty and staff and also. Uh, members of the, uh, the, the community, and uh, I know some people have traveled some distances uh, to come here, um, including, of course, our, our guest speaker tonight. And uh, we're delighted to have you here, and thank you so much for um, taking the time to come out and uh, listen, get this opportunity, rare opportunity, to listen to someone who, uh, who, who speaks with great wisdom, but also speaks uh, very much from the heart and very much as a friend of, uh, of Acadia University. Um, I'm really delighted to welcome uh, Dr. Peter Ernick to, uh, to Acadia. This is my first time uh, welcoming uh, Peter to the university, but um, it's certainly not the first time that he has been welcomed to this campus. He is a, a very old and dear friend uh, of Acadia University, and I think you visited here at least 10 times or, or more over much longer than 10 or 15 years, so it goes back a long way. And uh, it's really nice to give you a warm welcome back uh, to, to campus. Um, <clears throat> I also, of course, want to acknowledge uh, that, uh, uh, that Acadia is situated on Mi'kma'ki, the unceded uh, territory of the Mi'kmaq people. And uh, thank you to Don Julian for giving us the welcome in, in the language of his, of his people. Um, <clears throat> I also want to acknowledge that um, this is uh, coming up to the 20th anniversary of of the, the formation of Nunavik. It's hard to believe. I remember when that happened. I just can't believe it's 20 years ago uh, that, um, that Nunavik was, uh, was, a was created. And um, it is interesting to note that, um, that uh, our, our guest, uh, Peter, um, co-hosted <coughs> a symposium here uh, called the Nunavik at Five Symposium. And as you can guess, uh, that was a symposium that, that was held to recognize the fifth anniversary of the formation of, uh, of Nunavut. So some 15 years ago, uh, he hosted, uh, co-hosted this three-day event uh, that was attended by Innu leaders, including elders, uh, the then premier of Nunavut at the time, the language commissioner, the mayor of Iqaluit, uh, senior public officials from Inuit, and they reflected on the first five years of the creation of this new territory and talked about the research uh, priorities. And some of these research priorities led to opportunities um, to, to create opportunities for Inuit youth to connect with elders. And uh, this actually led to a long-established uh, partnership with Acadia University 
uh, that um, was uh, funded through the federal government and um, a number of other funding, funding partners and led to many opportunities for Acadia faculty, students and staff to collaborate with, uh, with uh, Inu leaders um, and also with um, uh, Inu fil filmmaker uh, Althea Anak Barrel and the artist and filmmaker John Houston is also uh, here tonight and uh, they are John nice to nice to see you and welcome welcome back to campus for to you as well um, Peter also hosted the Acadia students faculty and staff on a number of visits to none of it including a voyage by ship through the Arctic from McAllowit to Cape Dorset and this resulted in a historic bilingual learning resource including the first interactive documentary film for Inuit youth and world citizens he has delivered innumerable keynotes around the world and has been a regular visitor, as I've said, at Acadia University, most recently in 2015 when he delivered the 2015 Sidney Taylor Memorial Lecture uh, right here on campus, which was interestingly called Culture and Inuit Resilience, I Can Outrun Bureaucracy. <clears throat> and I can believe you can. <clears throat> so he continues to seek justice for residential school survivors, and he was invited into the heart of our parliament to hear former Prime Minister Stephen Harper apologize to residential school survivors. And he also participated uh, in a Canadian delegation trip to Rome uh, to meet Pope Benedict XVI uh, to uh, talk about the issue of the residential schools and the role of the church in that. I'm also delighted to say that uh, in 2006, Acadia University recognized uh, Peter Ernick's public service, his human rights advocacy, and his environmental stewardship, and his many achievements by awarding him an honorary doctorate of civil laws. And he is a truly distinguished member of the Acadia family and, of course, a very distinguished alumnus. So, Peter, welcome home. Thank you. <laughs> Just, um, <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, President. Carolyn, thank you. Thank you so much. That translates to uh, in English. Maybe it's cold outside. <laughs> <laughs> not, not really, but uh, <laughs> I figured I am allowed to say that. <laughs> it's cold. <laughs> I'm really happy to be here again and to see all of you. And uh, seeing uh, friends from a long time ago, John and uh, other people that came here and someone I call Takiyok, uh, tall man, <laughs> Takiyok. I uh, named him that name when we were naming uh, government indigenous departmental uh, boardrooms in Ottawa, indigenous names. I thought, about time that you have to have indigenous names, and I call him Takiyok for tall. <laughs> we're moving along pretty well with uh, work that we're doing to um, promote living in peace and harmony with one another. I call it Inu Katigi Chiagnak. If you have a problem in um, pronouncing the word, you're going to like the meaning of uh, Inu Katigi Chiagnak because uh, it's catching on all the time. Let me, let me hear you say that. <laughs> <laughs> How about uh, Inuit? That means Inuit traditional knowledge. Let me hear you. <laughs> Inuit, Inuit, John knows uh, Inuit, 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 I want to talk a little bit about that uh, tonight, but before I do, I want to tell you a little story 
uh, of what happened uh, in my lifetime. First of all, I want to tell you that I was born in the Nikloo and lived in the Nikloo for the first 11 years of my life until I was taken by the church and the Canadian government to go to a residential school. So you are looking at a residential school survivor. Here's what I want to tell you. Back in um, uh, September of 1994, a fellow from Toronto uh, writes a letter to the editor of Nunatiak News, a territorial paper written in both uh, Inuktitut and English out of the Faluit. And he said, he asked the question, whatever happened to the Eskimos, he said. So um, being a writer and someone who uh, responds uh, to these things, uh, I thought to myself, um, you know, uh, as Inuit, we have always called ourselves Inuit, which means people. Someone else called us Eskimo, and some people might be offended by that uh, word. And I thought, no, nah, I'm not going to get into an argument with the guy from Toronto. <laughs> so uh, I thought for a moment, and here's what I said to Dunatiak uh, News. Dear uh, editor, in regard to so-and-so's uh, letter to the editor who asked, whatever happened to the Eskimos? I said, uh, you know, they have all moved to Edmonton. <laughs> And they've been playing uh, football ever since <laughs> and winning lots of cups. So that's what I said. When I was very young, I was taught to be a very good hunter, which is what I thought I was going to be for the rest of my life. I grew up in an igloo. I have a great deal of respect for my igloo. When I was growing up in Nauyat, living in an igloo with my parents, my igloo was my mansion. It was small, roughly 25 feet in diameter, but we had lots of care, lots of love, lots of respect, lots of laughter, lots of smiles, lots of stories. That's what we had in our igloo when I was growing up in uh, Nauyat. For a time, it was known as Repulse Bay. My father has a connection here to uh, Bay of Fundy, and I want to tell you a little bit about it. There are so many, quite a lot of Inuit, who came down here to southern Canada a long time ago, helping other people. And those are the people that I also want to give credit to. Because uh, if it weren't for Inuit, people would not have survived in the Arctic, particularly the explorers, the missionaries, the government agencies, and certainly not John Franklin, who did not want Inuit help. And so he did not, never, ha never lived to tell the story about his experience with Inuit in the Arctic. But Raoul Amit Amutsen did. He lived to tell the story, having lived with the Inuit in 1904 and 1905. Inuit and Norwegian people, through Raoul Amutsen, today they have a great relationship. They live with each other miles and miles apart, but they have a great life together. They respect each other so much. So they have a museum in um, Norway, people's pictures, Inuit pictures of 1904, 1905. My relatives, my ancestors from my mother's side. My father, for example, was one of many people, along with three other Inuit, who came down here in 1925. In 1924, a ship, a trading ship, French trading ship, uh, frozen, frozen in in Baker Lake in 1924. So in 1925, the ship uh, uh, hired four Inuit to steer the boat from Baker Lake all the way to Shelbourne, right here 
in your community. However, they came down here. They went through the Davis Strait. They went to Newfoundland. My father used to tell a story. Remember, I was born in the Nicolou, but I was already being assimilated into the uh, European culture through the Hudson Bay Company. Imagine my father's time in 1925 and 1926. Baker Lake probably had only about three or four buildings. And when they came down here to Halifax, to Shellboard, it must have been like a really big city, big place. So he said they went to uh, Newfoundland after traveling for about two months in the Hudson Bay and Davis Strait. And he said they went to the um, uh, to this place, the um, four Inuit, along with their captain, Captain Robertson. My father said he looked around. He sees another Inuk standing over there. He said uh, he moves. The Inuk moves, same time. <laughs> he said that he smiled at the Inuk. The Inuk smile turned out to be a barber shop. That's what it was, barber shop. And he's never seen a barber shop in his life. And then he tells another story going through Bay of Fundy in 1925. And this is the, what the captain said about these uh, Inuit on that ship. He said, um, if it weren't for those young Eskimo boys, our trip would have been a lot harder. Inuit are very good out in the sea. We're used to paddling our kayak. We know, we know our water. So Inuit who helped to steer the boat, they knew exactly what they were doing. He, Captain Robertson, said um, they stopped at a little community out here in the Bay of Fundy. So um, he said uh, in, the, in the book, he was quoted as saying this in St. John's Newfoundland paper. He said, one of those Eskimo boys bought a watch. Like any other Canadian, he looked at his watch several times that day. My father used to talk about buying a watch out in the little community out here in the Bay of Fundy, and he was talking about my father. <laughs> so um, storytelling is an extremely important aspect of Inuit culture. Storytelling about hunting, storytelling about fishing, women storytelling about uh, sewing, caribou clothing. Sometimes you ask me, how cold did it get um, in an igloo. The question should be, uh, how did you keep warm in the igloo? <laughs> yeah. How did you keep warm in an igloo? Well, we had to wear caribou clothing all the time inside the igloo. In other words, uh, our igloo was only lit with what we call kudluk, Inuit oil lamp. Half moon shape, made out of, uh, normally out of soapstone. And it had a seal fat uh, to uh, keep it warm, to keep it lit. We used it for our um, um, cooking. We used it to uh, boil water. We used it to um, dry our clothes. We used it for our heat. Sometimes at night, you would uh, keep a little light in the kudluk, uh, much like you have a hallway light towards the washroom, for example. So um, we had a little light in the igloo that much. We had to conserve also. We Inuit know a lot about conserving. When we were on the land, for example, long time ago, I remember we used to buy matches when we used to go out on the land. We used, we used the matches that came with the Hudson Bay Company. But you know what? In order to conserve those matches, my father used to split them in half oh. so that he has more for the future. That's what we used to do. I grew up in a very, very happy family. I grew up in a very, very happy life. I grew up in a place called Nauyat, 
when now we had, had maybe about the same amount of people, such as you tonight, about 100 people in 1950, 1960s. All the Inuit lived in igloos in the winter time. There was only about five houses in the community. My friend John Houston knows something about that because he probably seen something very similar in King Knight, Cape Dorset, in 1950. The two belong to the uh, Roman Catholic Church. Three belong to the Hudson Bay Company. That's all. Those are all the buildings we had in Nauyat in 1950 and 1960. Talk about transportation in the 1950s. We traveled by dock team most of the time when we were out caribou hunting, when we were out seal hunting. And we respect totally the animals that we hunted since time immemorial. Let me give you an example. I remember we lived out in the, uh, out in the sea in the winter time. We had an igloo. Matter of fact, there were about uh, four or five igloo. Some names like uh, Jack Anarok, you know something about names like that, because Jack and I grew up together in Nauyat. So we grew up with his family. Every time, which was not always often, my father would catch a seal. He would pull in the seal through the entrance of the uh, igloo, to the floor of the igloo. It was my mother's responsibility. It was actually a woman's responsibility most of the time to butcher the seal, to skin the seal. However, just before she uh, skinned the seal, she would uh, take a piece of fresh water ice, put it into her mouth, opens the mouth of a seal, put the fresh water into the mouth of a seal, in Inuktitut, that translated to, this is to make sure that all seals under the sea, under the ice, are not thirsty. This uh, quotation that I just provided for you is in the book called um, Sacred Hunt by David Pilly. So we have, as Inuit, always respected the animals that we hunted. And we shared all the animals that we hunted. We shared our catch with the other people. We give some to our neighbor. It could have been part of the seal, certain part of a seal. It could have been uh, part of a seal fat, so that they too can have light in their igloo, especially those who are less fortunate than other people. We shared our Inuit dogs with other people. We shared our uh, kamutik sled with other people so that they could go out hunting on the land. We shared our words with the other people, words of wisdom, words of knowledge about the land, words of uh, animals on the land, so that other people know where to go hunting in the winter time and survive. We were always pretty well good to each other. We were not perfect people. <laughs> we were simple human beings. But we helped each other all the time. I do a lot of uh, today. Um, John is my friend on Facebook. You're my friend on Facebook. Um, Cynthia is my friend on Facebook. <laughs> Carolyn is my friend on Facebook. You were my friend too? All right. I have about uh, 4,700 friends on Facebook. People I know pretty well. So I do a lot of uh, Inuit cultural uh, history about Inuit on Facebook. I get a great big discussion uh, how to improve the system, whether we are doing something uh, to improve the system or not. But I do a lot of uh, cultural work on uh, Inuit uh, culture, Inuit history, where Inuit come from. I do a lot of work to promote Inuit culture. I do a lot of work to promote Inuwakatigi Tsiagnap living in peace and harmony, care, love, and compassion and respect with each other. Because uh, this is what we used to do in Nauya. Inuit were great travelers by dog team 
since time immemorial. My own parents traveled from uh, Utku Hiksalik, which is a uh, back river in English, south of Johaven, by duck team. They traveled to Utku Hiksalik, Wager Bay, south of Nauyat, Repulse Bay, where I was born. And they traveled up to Nauyat. From Nauyat, they traveled up to Hall Beach and Iglulik. And they said they traveled up to Pond Inlet and Arctic Bay in several years, hey? Eh? However, he said uh, on the way back, their dogs died off in Nauyat, and they got stuck in Nauyat. So another hunter in Nauyat gave them a male and female dog. And that's how they uh, uh, got many dogs again. They survived. So this is the kind of uh, life that I grew up in now at Repulse Bay. This is the kind of thing that I promote in uh, Nunavut, Nunatiavut, Nunavik, Inuvialuit, within Inuit homelands, within many parts of Canada that I travel around, that I go and visit in every part of the country. Because um, the more we um, promote Inu Khatigitiyarnak, the more we can achieve together, the more we can accomplish together for our people, particularly for our young people. There's so much discussion today about mental health services in Canada. There is a lack of mental health services in Nunavut. There is mental health, lack of mental health services within Inuit homeland. This is why we have so many Inuit suicides among our people. Our people, it is not in our terminology as Inuit to commit suicide. Igminirnik is not in our terminology, not since time immemorial. My father used to talk about uh, suicide, but in very small numbers. He said, when people got very old, very sick, they would go after the land and they would do away with themselves. Igminirtut. So that's the discussion that I used to hear most, not so frequently, when I was in my youth. 10 years old, 15 years old, 20 years old in Nunavut. But today, it is it has become a huge um, struggle on the part of our people to see our people doing away with themselves. Most of them are young people. They commit suicide from the age of nine years old, the youngest one, the oldest one being about 24 and 25 years old. According to our own statistics, one in eight commit suicide in Nunavut. This uh, suicide among our people has to have an ending. It has to end sometime. How we can stop it, how we can stop it, how we can end it, is to work together. Living in peace and harmony with one another. That is how we can end suicide among our people. Because our young people are our future. We need, politically speaking, we need to tell our politicians, our governments, community and territorial and federal level, that we need to have more and improved mental health services in the Arctic to better address the needs of our young people. How many? Um, how many mental health workers do we have in Nunavut? Two for the entire territory? Two, three, less than five. That's all we have for 37,000 people. We have taken steps to try and end suicide among our people. We have a hotline in the Haluit, staffed by a volunteer. We have uh, meetings and meetings after meetings. Many politicians spoke out. Many people spoke out. 
I have spoken out. But we have to be more determined in order to stop, in order to end these suicides among our people. It means we have to work together like our people used to work together a long, long time ago. Because it is not the first time that we're facing struggle among our people. Now, Nunavut is a growing community. I speak about um, Inuit of yesteryear. I speak about traditional Inuit. What about today? We are still Inuit. We are still sharing. We are still generous with the other people. We are still helping each other. We are still fighting this thing called racism. My mother used to say in Inuktitut, I translated to English something like this. Don't make fun of people with the way they look. Help the other people. Be generous with the other people. Share what you have with the other people. We're still doing that. We are, as Inuit, very talented people. We are a very creative people. We are great carvers. Inuit have been carving many Yichu carvings, whatever they might have been. Little harpoon, little ulu, little snow knife, little fish lister, and things like that since time immemorial. My friend knows a lot about Inuit carving from King Knight, Cape Dorset. Because Cape Dorset, King Knight, has one of the best carvings in the world. I'm really proud of that. Eh? Really, really great carvers out of uh, King Knight. Some of their carvers have become very famous in Canada, very famous around the world. Late Kinoyuak, uh, for example, was a very good artist, carver, and printmaker. So Inuit have a lot of pride in what we do. We are always patient people. We are survival people. And we are also resilient people. We have a habit of bouncing right back, even though we went through some very, very difficult times. So what do we do today in order to promote our Inuit culture, Inuit language, Inuit history. So many, so many things have taken place among our people. There are some young people like you, many of you, who are very creative people. I understand you were watching, I'm not sure if it's you or somebody else, angry Inuk, just before I came here. Was that the same group? Oh, all right, OK. <laughs> all right. So people like um, Alicia, Aknakok, they're very, very smart people. They live in two worlds today. And the, and the young men and the young women that we have within Inuit Nunang and Inuit homeland. They can go out and hunt. They can go out seal hunting. And they can go back to their community and go back to work on the technology. That's what they do. That's what they do in our communities in Nunavut. This is very, very good to hear. It's a good achievement. In Nunavut, we have, um, for example, um, graduated, correct me if I'm wrong, 13 Inuit law lawyers in 20 years. 13. That's quite a good accomplishment for people who just moved out of the igloo only 30 years before. In Nunavut, we have graduated 10 Inuit nurses. Correct? Yep. Before, all of our nurses came from southern Canada. Matter of fact, in the beginning, in the 1960s, they came from Australia and New Zealand with the government of Canada. Today, we are producing, we are getting more and more Inuit involved at the technical level. 
we have nurses, we have, uh, oh, one other thing, something that I'm really, really proud of. And I know you're going to be really proud of this one. My cousin's daughter, from Chesterfield Inlet, who became the first Enoch surgeon. You know her? You read about her? Very young, very young Enoch woman. She became the first Enoch surgeon. What a proud moment we're going through as Inuit in Nunavut. In Nunavut, we have a lot of successes about people because of the people. I was telling um, a couple of people earlier today that we have two airlines as Inuit so far. These things are merging soon, hey? Um, we have Canadian Airline, a jet service from Southern Canada to Iqaluit. And we also have First Air um, jet service coming from Southern Canada to Iqaluit, as they do in Kujuak in Nunavik, as they do from Winnipeg to uh, Rankin Inlet, as they do from uh, uh, Edmonton to Yellowknife, and then to uh, Cambridge Bay. These airlines are owned by Inuit of both uh, Nunavut and Nunavik, as well as Inuvialuit in the Northwest Territories. I do fly Air Canada quite a bit, eh? I guarantee you, those of you who have not flown to the Arctic by um, Canadian North or First Air, when you do from Ottawa to Iqaluit, you're going to get a real meal. <laughs> on Canadian North, as well as First Air. The other day I fly here, I had potato chips and soft drink. Yeah. One of the things that allow us Inuit to be very resilient people, to be patient people, let me give you an example of this thing called residential school. 32 years ago, I started work on uh, to, uh, residential school impact for Inuit. I was a member of the territorial legislature, and I made a member statement in the Legislative Assembly of the Northwest Territories about the impact of residential school. I said, when I made my statement, that I am aware of the survivors of residential school who were sexually abused by the clergy. We had a loss of culture. We had a loss of language. We had a loss of uh, Inuit traditional beliefs, such as shamanism, from the impact of residential school. Over the course of time, the very people who survived the residential school Paul Kwasa, Jana Mogwalik, Mary Simon, Sheila Watt, Clotier, Simon Abba, all these people who were impacted, and there were many more impacted by the residential school system, who got hit with the yardstick for speaking in Uktitut in the classroom, like myself in September of 1958 were the people who decided to create Nunavut. We decided to create Nunavut so that we can retrieve, we can take back, and we can reclaim our culture and our language. You know, in Nunavut, for example, Inuktut language is one of the languages not only surviving, but it is one of the strongest languages in Nunavut, in Canada along with the Inuit language, Inuit dialect in Nunavik. In some areas it's dying, unfortunately, but it's going to come alive again. I know. It's going to come alive again because each one of us, those who are in responsible positions, will take on the responsibility and making sure it doesn't die, it lives forever. That's what we're going to be doing. It's a really good thing to do. Are you Dorset? Sorry? Are you Dorset? No? He's about to graduate from high school. Oh, University, okay. So good to meet you. Hmm? He looks a bit like 
Good to meet you. One of the things that I, I just uh, really like uh, you being here because uh, it's good to see so many young people, little kids, being here. It's good to see so many kids being part of the uh, audience uh, such as yourself because it's a really good thing to do because you're learning something from our experiences. You're learning something from what we have learned of what has gone through. Now, going back to um, Nunavut. Inuit Kauye Mayatuhangit. John knows how to say that. How many, who else knows how to say that? Inuit Let me hear you. Right on. Right on. Takiyuk? No, I don't, don't, don't worry. Inuit Kauye Mayatuhangit is Inuit traditional knowledge. It's what we have uh, lived with since time immemorial. It's something that's been passed on to us from our parents about hunting and sewing and talking and storytelling and things like that since time immemorial. It's the foundation of government of Nunavut that we established on April 1, 1999. Inuit Kauimaya Tuhangit is an extremely important aspect of Nunavut government, Inuit of Nunavut. It's something, if you take a look at the Inuit values and principles in the Google, you're going to like it. Right, Cynthia? Right on. You're going to like it. It's something that every Canadian in Canada should know about, Inuit values and principles, because you can learn a lot from Inuit. You can learn a lot about uh, Inuit patients. You can learn a lot about uh, Inuit survival. You can learn a lot about Inuit resiliency. That's what we've done since time immemorial. We went through a heck of a lot of hard time in the past, starvation period out of Baker Lake. All the things that I talked about in terms of suicide, but we survived. We are survival people. But particularly, you and I can work to promote because it means reconciliation and healing for all of us. Healing and reconciliation is a really important step to take forward. What happened to us at the residential school, we've talked about it. We have journeyed so far with healing and reconciliation. Now it's time to work towards healing and reconciliation of all people in Canada. Oh. I say this, I say this in all honesty, because Indigenous, the, the, the impact of residential school for indigenous people is not only indigenous history, it is also a Canadian history. Canadians have a right. Canadians have a duty. All Canadians have a responsibility to know what happened to us at the residential school. It's so important that um, every Canadian start learning about indigenous people of this country. We need to, you need to learn, and I can teach you. You need to learn about indigenous history, indigenous culture in every classroom in Canada. There's no other way. We got to do it. And we got to do it together. We got to do it together because we need to promote living in peace and harmony with one another. And we can do it, and we can do it together. Because we're Canadians. We're one big family. Thank you so much for listening to me. Today, you may be 
if you have some questions, um, I'd be happy to answer answer questions. John. First of all, thank you. Secondly, just one question. Do you think there's any relationship between living for all those months and all those years in uh, Igloo and Inuhatigi Kiamna? That's a really good question. Igloo, living in an igloo with a family of five, in my case, we were Inuhatigi Tiaktut. We live in peace, complete peace and harmony together in our own little igloo. My father and my, fa and my mother, me, I had a little brother too, and my sister and her husband, we all lived in the same igloo. You know, sometimes you ask me, um, how did you survive in an igloo? Well, we never fought in an igloo. <laughs> we never argued in an igloo. Whenever there was um, some sort of a little problem with uh, my sister and her husband's um, marriage, for example, the elders took over. Elders uh, provided advice so that they too can live with each other in peace and harmony, love, compassion, and respect with one another. So um, that went with um, uh, sharing of the meat. That went with um, um, sharing with the people who come by to our igloo, visiting our igloo. Uh, people just used to come by into the igloo. We don't knock. <laughs> How can you knock in an igloo, right? <laughs> so uh, people used to come in without knocking, which is the way Inuit uh, used to do before we had doors in the house. So um, it promoted a really good relationship and friendship with a lot of people inside the igloo. It promoted Inuhatigi Tchernak, living in peace and harmony with one another. Yes. Anybody else? Can you give us any idea how much of the culture has spread in our schools in Canada? I'm, I'm happy to know there's a course here at Acadia. Um, Hold on, just a... Uh, yes, oh, are you having trouble hearing me? Yep. I'm a school mom, I thought everyone... I am. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm wondering how far um, the education has spread in the schools so far. How many cases you know of. I don't mean numbers, but uh, provinces that are really, um, really pushing this. You mean uh, indigenous culture into yes. the classroom? Yes. Okay. I, I'm wondering about BC in particular, or, or, or well, anywhere. OK. You know. I'll answer that question. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, the, um, you're asking me about how much uh, indigenous culture is going into the classroom in Canada. Yes. Not much. OK. Not much. And let me, let me explain. Uh, I was also telling some people earlier today, uh, how many of you thought, how many of you thought in this room that one day you would be learning about indigenous culture, or in our case, Inuit culture, when you were growing up? None. It was not thought of. It was not considered at the time when education system, when curriculum was established in Canada throughout the provinces. Today, um, with our pushing, with our uh, insistence to uh, Canada, uh, there is a bit of uh, indigenous uh, education taking place at various uh, educational institutions in Canada. But that's not enough. It's got to be in every classroom in Canada that every classroom in Canada should be learning about indigenous culture, language, indigenous history, Inuit history, Inuit language, Inuit culture in our case. That's what I would like to see throughout Canada. Now, in the Northwest Territories and in Nunavut, we are teaching the impact of uh, residential school uh, from the 1950s and 60s um, at grade 10 level, which is a good thing to do. Uh, so um, what I do, what I'm asked to do, and I do it with great deal of pride, uh, is I go to Iqaluit, when the Department of Education gathers all the teachers in Iqaluit in April, 
and they asked me to come up and they asked me to teach about the impact of residential school. So that's a really good thing to do. And I also know that uh, province of Manitoba, and I think province of uh, Nova Scotia is doing some of that as well. I'm not, somebody has to correct me about this province, but I just heard about that through um, various uh, stories. But I know that Manitoba was teaching um, the impact of residential school in Manitoba. But I say that um, let's uh, teach more of uh, indigenous culture in every classroom in Canada. That's a really good thing to do. Thank you. I know in Newfoundland we, we think more of the culture because, of course, there is an Inuit mm -hmm. population. And so we bring the music into uh, the schools mm -hmm. and the culture, some drama, uh, dance. That's all, I think. I go, I'm invited to go to uh, Inuit uh, communities in Nunatiawut, uh, Labrador, um, Nunavik, Nunavut, uh, to teach Inuit culture. I teach uh, um, the history of Inuit, where we come from. I teach about the fact that we came from Mongolia some 40,000 years ago. Um, we came, we, we went from uh, Far Eastern Russia to uh, Alaska to Canada and then to Greenland by kayak or by uh, umiak, the skin boat, and by traveling by that team or walking, you know. So um, I know part of that history really, really well. And um, it's good for people to know that, even for Inuit to know that, because a lot of Inuit don't know where we came from. But I know where we came from. Um, I went to uh, Mongolia seven years ago. You know, I have never seen so many lookalikes of Inuit. <laughs> and, I thought for, and I thought for sure Jack Anawa was there. Um, Jean Baptiste was there. <laughs> and uh, they felt the same about Inuit. <laughs> you, we are their future. Eh? And I talk about, uh, 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 you know, uh, how much. Uh, uh, welcome I got when I went when I got to the University of Mongolia because I was speaking uh, keynote speaker for Peter Millikan when he was a speaker of the House of Commons and uh, So I talked a lot about the history of Inuit and close relationship that we had some 40,000 years ago and um, I know that their men for example do throat singing in Mongolia our women do throat singing as Inuit <laughs> Um, so we have uh, quite a lot of uh, Mongolia Inuit uh, similarities, and I was telling them that, um, did you know that um, when our Inuit babies are born, they have a blue mark on their bum? How many of you know that? One, he, two? He told me. Huh? He told me. <laughs> okay. Only two know that? Well, when we are born as little children, little babies, we have a blue mark right here. And we call it Mongolian blue mark. Hmm. Yeah. And uh, when you, should have, uh, you should have seen the nurses in the 1960s. They thought uh, women and men were beating up their little children, eh? Uh, because of the blue mark. Blue mark disappears after four or five years. Yeah. Mongolians have it too. Mongol huh? The Mongolians have it too? Yeah, Mongolians have it too, yes. Mongolians have it too. and. Um, Indigenous, indigenous people have it as well, uh, First Nations, and also um, Koreans have it. Yeah. Any, any Asian, uh, I think, uh, relating to Inuit uh, um, have a blue mark on their bum. In none of it, um, the, their, the education system, do they control their um, education system and do they include indigenous history um, in, in their curriculum? Language. In language. Yeah. yeah. I am uh, I am not from Nunavut. Or oh, sorry, Nunavik. However, I know in Nunavik they have a uh, Katipik regional government and they have uh, educational responsibility for all the things that uh, they do with their education system. And I know they teach uh, really well with respect to Inuit culture and Inuit language. Because um, one thing that I know about my uh, fellow Inuit from Nunavik, is the little kids, uh, little kids speaking Inuktitut to each other, right? So they do a really good job. And they do a really good job in writing system in Roman orthography. Um, 
But hey, I changed somehow to build an igloo. I went to Nunavik at, uh, on their invitation to go and teach uh, how to build an igloo. Because uh, my father once said to me, if you don't know how to build an igloo, you cannot be married. <laughs> so I work really, really hard, eh? <laughs> Triggers my curiosity, sir. What causes the blue mark? What causes the blue mark? Genes. It's a biological. Yeah, it's got to be bio. It's a. Uh, it's there only because we are. Fades in time. Here we go. Yeah. It fades. It fades. Uh, it fades in time. After about five years, it fades. It's not there forever. It's, it's like a bruise. It looks like a bruise, but it's not a bruise. It's just there because, just because we are indigenous people. Uh, you don't have it, right? No? You don't have it, but we do. Thank you. You're welcome. Who else? Who else? Going once. <laughs> what other story, story do you want me to tell you? Something that tell, ask me a question that you always wanted to know about Inuit since you were a little kid. Tell me, Carolyn. Um, how do you uh, practice being connected and grounded to the earth? What how do I practice? Like to become, um, to show the respect to the earth and your love for the earth. How do you practice becoming uh, connected to the land that you're on? The real, that's a really good question. I go, here's my own experience. I grew up in an igloo and I grew up in a tent in the summertime. We walked on the land to go caribou hunting all the time. We walked on the land to go fishing all the time. We catch animals such as caribou. We um, drink the water from the land, the most fresh water in the world. We um, survived on uh, water like that. We have a great deal of respect for the water because without water, we always said, you won't, be, you won't survive. And animals are the same way. Without water, they will not survive. So um, anything that grow on the land, such as uh, blackberries, we eat them. Blueberries, we eat them. We have a growing season um, of these things uh, for about a month every, uh, um, every uh, August and part of September. And there is also what we call uh, akpik. In English, what is it? Cloudberry. Cloudberry. Cloudberries grow in the Arctic. Uh, not everything, but we eat all these things that grow on the land. And animals do the same thing. So we eat our caribou, we eat our uh, fish, we eat our sea mammals, seals, walrus, a beluga, a narwhal, a bowhead. So we are completely connected uh, to the land. The um, Inuit and animals are inseparable. That's the best way of putting it, I guess. And that's why uh, we have uh, so much respect for the land. We tell the uh, developer, such as a mining company, don't damage our land. Don't damage our waters. Don't uh, damage our animals that we uh, eat to survive. That's what we say to our developers today. And climate change is something that uh, I'm very aware of too, because uh, climate change is real. Climate change is dangerous for people. It is dangerous for animals, for example. Um, all that old siku tokak, the old yellowish ice, is disappearing. That's the old ice that uh, polar bears like to hunt seals from. Seals like to uh, scent tan on that old ice in the summertime, eh? And that's where polar bears like to hunt. So that old yellowish ice is disappearing in the summertime. Um, summertime, springtime comes in earlier because of the climate change. Fall time comes in later. Ice doesn't get a stick as it used to every uh, end of uh, October. So sometimes you have people going out fishing when the ice forms. They think it's still this stick when in fact it's this stick and they fall through the ice. Sometimes they don't survive and that becomes a danger 
for uh, F uh, Fisher. Excuse me. Uh, the other thing about uh, climate change and global warming, when I was growing up in Nauiat, uh, Repulse Bay, temperature used to be only about 15 degrees. When you were in King Night in those years, it used to be only about 15 degrees. Today, you can go to Baker Lake, you can go to Kanyakshinak Rankin Inlet. In July, you can experience um, plus 20, plus 25, plus 30, plus 35. Sometimes even plus 40. You remember um, Colleen Jones, who used to be on uh, CBC uh, weather um, forecast? She used to say, and the warmest temperature in Canada today is in Cambridge Bay at plus 44, 45. So you can experience that kind of uh, hot, hot temperature in the Arctic in July. And you go to Rankin Inlet and you go to Baker Lake, for example, you can now see in, during these months uh, robin. Robins in those communities, you can. So, um, you know, they're, they're in, the, in the south, but you can go to Baker Lake or Rankin and you see those. So that's uh, the impact of um, climate change and global warming in the Arctic. Sometimes, um, in the winter time, you have extreme cold temperature in the Arctic, uh, like minus 60, minus 65 in Kangakshinak, in Nauyat, or um, up in um, Pan Inlet, for example. Yeah. So you have both extremes, eh, in the winter and in the summertime. John. To my understanding, every other circumpolar <coughs> Arctic jurisdiction has a university, but Canada doesn't have an Arctic university, and I don't mean a community college. Mm -hmm. a university. university. What is your thinking on that? We've been uh, promoting uh, Arctic University for a long period of time. We've been talking about uh, uh, establishing Arctic University for a long period of time now as far back as uh, 30, 35 years ago. But today, I, oh, I support Arctic University. I really do support Arctic University because uh, uh, a lot of our people go to southern Canada to go to university, Montreal, uh, Winnipeg, uh, Edmonton, Acadia, um, Ottawa. Ottawa. Ottawa, you know, all these places. Um, we need to have an uh, Arctic university. We need to see it becoming a reality because of the type of uh, courses, uh, type of training that we want to provide for our people in the Arctic. I support um, uh, Arctic university, yes. It's a good, uh, it's a good conversation piece. Uh, we need to talk about it more. A lot of politicians in the Arctic are uh, talking about it today. What needs to change? in uh, the government of Canada's relationship with the Inuit? We can, we can help them to change it. Yeah. Well, what, what needs to change? What does, what does the, they need to, be, to do differently? Yeah, let me get there, OK? The um, colonialism was a really bad one. You're uh, looking at the victim of colonialism. I don't want to talk about what happened in terms of colonialism, um, but let me just mention about four things. Slaughter of dogs by the RCMP in the 1950s and 60s and 70s. Forced uh, relocation uh, by the government to the communities in the 1950s and 60s. Uh, forced removal from our parents to go to residential school uh, in the 1950s and 60s. Um, forced um, uh, TB treatment of people um, who were sent away from their homes uh, to southern Canada at various sanatoriums in the south. Those are part of the colonialism. And if I tell you that I, my name uh, for, um, from 1947 to 1970 was Peter E3546, that's colonialism too, but let me explain, okay? And I'm going to explain it to you this way, my way. Uh, in 1941, a um, federal government official uh, from Ottawa, I mean, they all come from Ottawa, right? <laughs> uh, he went to uh, the Arctic. And John and you and 
you, you can relate to what I'm going to say. He went back to Ottawa and, and he said, uh, look, Prime Minister, uh, those uh, Eskimo names are too hard to pronounce. We got to come up with a better system of identifying the Eskimo. So in 1941, uh, they established what they call a disk numbering system. So if you live in the Northwest Territories among five communities, your number started with W1, W2, W3, 4, 5, and the number was attached to it. And then if you were living in Joe Haven onto the Eastern Arctic, um, including um, uh, Nunavik, your number started with E1, E2, E3, all the way to E9. When they got to Nauyat, my name became E3546. And that's what I was known by, like all the other Inuit in the Northwest Territories and Nunavik, with a number, Peter E3546. John E9772. But they excluded um, Nunat uh, Nunat Labrador because they were not part of Canada until 1949. So um, what needs to change? Well, we've changed that numbering system. Now we have all, all of us have um, a surname, um, proper surname. And uh, they, got, they got rid of uh, uh, this number, and they provided us with sin number. So we became sinners too, <laughs> OK? So um, that's the history of that particular part of uh, this numbering system. Now, what needs to change? Uh, we need to take a look at, uh, more seriously, call to action by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Call to action uh, is not a recommendation, but it is a call to action. Um, what needs to happen in the part of the government of Canada is to take this uh, more seriously, building a better relationship with the indigenous people of Canada. That's what needs to happen in a much more aggressive way and in, in a much better way than we have, they have been doing in the past. Now, I am, uh, along with um, uh, Claudia Kamanda, uh, I think you know her, I'm uh, with uh, a uh, Métis fellow from um, uh, Manitoba. The three of us are advisors to Indian Affair, Indigenous Affairs Minister Carolyn Bennett. We tell her how to um, establish a better relationship with the Indigenous people of Canada. So in a small way, that mind is changing um, because of the call to action by the, um, uh, by the government, uh, by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, Murray Sinclair. I worked with uh, Murray Sinclair as his uh, uh, Inuit cultural advisor for three years. And uh, as a survivor of residential school, I knew quite a lot about uh, Inuit uh, history of residential school. Now, uh, let me move this forward in a much bigger way also. Pope Francis also needs to apologize to people of Canada, the uh, survivors of residential school, not only to the indigenous people, but to all people of Canada. That's what he's got to do in order to promote living in peace and harmony with everybody. Mm -hmm. That's that's the way. That's what I say. Does that answer your question? What What about money? Money. Money. Like, uh, because if you follow the money and like if they underfund, that's a, a form of uh, um, um, dealing dealing with you with less than. The um, government of Canada has to provide a lot more money to the indigenous people of Canada. Um, money in terms of uh, better housing uh, for indigenous people of Canada. Money in terms of providing better health and social services, mental health services, uh, justice issues, uh, cultural issues. So there has to be much more money provided for indigenous people of Canada. Um, after all, we're the, uh, we're the original Canadians and we're proud of it. And uh, it's something that uh, Canadian government has to keep that in mind in order to establish a better relationship with the indigenous people of Canada. I know they got lots of money. <laughs> you know? I know that. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. I have one, one question that's a difficult one to ask, which is that um, uh, when I was a child, my mother told me that we were related to indigenous people way, way, way back in New England. 
but there was 500 years of colonialism in New England, so, you know, you lose track. And when I look around at people and I look at their faces or I hear their stories or where they're from, I know there's a lot of indigenous blood that's in people who don't know they have indigenous blood. And that's why I feel it's part of the reconciliation in Canada. To me, it doesn't feel like a we, they. It feels like an us. And so I'm wondering what your feeling is about having discussions about the fact that people are blends. We've been intermarrying for a long time. And how do you feel about, like you said, the, the reconciliation, but, but also coming to terms with the fact that we've been intermarrying? What are your thoughts on that? Inter particularly interrelationships? Yeah, with or without marriage. <laughs> you know, uh, you're right. We have a lot of uh, interrelation, inter marriage, interrelations, uh, marri racial marriage uh, by many, many people in Canada. Uh, particularly Inuit, uh, I, the ones that I know a lot about are um, uh, married uh, uh, to um, the, um, the descendants, I guess, of the whalers. Mm -hmm. The whaling uh, period took place in the 1800s, and uh, a lot of people, a lot of Inuit became mixed uh, European, mixed American, mixed Scottish, mixed whatever else, and right? African too, right? And Africans too, of yeah. course. The harpooner. Yeah, the harpooner. We have uh, in Nunavut both um, um, Nunavut and Nunavik, as, as well as um, Nunatjewut in Labrador, in Uvaluit in the Northwest Territory, as they do in Kalasit Nunat in Greenland. They do have a lot of uh, interracial marriages uh, between um, the, the European the white man and the Inuit, and as, as you say, uh, between um, the black men and the Inuit uh, women as well. My father was also um, the son of a whaler uh, who, was, who was born at the end of 1800. That whaler probably has another 10 more sons and, and, and daughters in the Kiwaitan region, Kiwatlik region. So you take a look around in Nunavut, particularly in places like Southampton Island, Coral Harbor, Pagnac uh, for example, uh, different parts of um, uh, Central Arctic up in Cambridge Bay. There's lots of white uh, Inuit um, uh, mixture of Inuit. My own children, uh, because I'm married to uh, a French Canadian, they're a mixture of Inuit and. But one thing I can tell you, with all that mixture of uh, European blood, our sons and daughters will always think more like Inuit. Mm. That's what I like. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe, maybe those of us in Canada that don't necessarily know our indigenous yeah. heritage can mm -hmm. take pride in, yeah. in that. Indigenous. Mm -hmm. let, me, let me give you uh, let me give you a really good example. Um, Inuit Studies Conference uh, is something that uh, um, I help to um, grow in a better way. Um, Inuit Studies Conference is uh, sponsored by the universities, uh, such as uh, Laval University and other universities related to the Arctic. Um, one day. I got to uh, Laval, Quebec. I was invited to be a keynote speaker. Um, uh, we're about, we had two, two, 200 people in the room. And um, I walked in to the podium. I looked around and I said, uh, well, where is all the Inuit? <laughs> Raise your hand. Only one Inuk, and he was Inupiaq, raised their hand. And I thought, let's get more Inuit here right now. Well, look, Aberdeen, 2000. Um, we had uh, 45 Inuit presenters about Inuit culture and customs, and it grew so much um, to have a lot more Inuit participating at this Inuit Studies Conference. Here's why I suggested that it be held in Aberdeen in 2000. Because uh, a lot of Inuit are related to uh, Scottish people through the Hudson Bay Company personnel since the uh, 1930s. And they, ha they, ma they made a lot of babies, those <laughs> people, eh? So um, 
I wanted to see more Inuit meeting their Scottish relatives in Scotland. So um, there was a purpose to have a, a meeting of Inuit studies in Scotland. We had about 50 to 60 Inuit going to uh, Scotland. And at one point, I was asked to speak to uh, Scottish and Inuit relatives. And I spoke to them like this, just like you are now. I spoke to them about uh, how important it is to have a, a family relationship, a family contact with, uh, between yourself. Uh, so um, many people have gone back uh, either to uh, uh, Scotland to rediscover uh, their relatives. Zebedi Nungak from northern Quebec is one of them. He's gone to uh, Scotland to um, uh, find out his uh, family tree. And a uh, number of other people have done the same thing. I think it's a really good thing to do because um, people have to know who their relations are. Uh, those of us, um, um, my father's father, um, apparently, uh, I think an American um, um, whaler. That's what my buddy said, Frank Tester said, eh? and Ken Harper too. Um, I never knew who that man is, and I really don't care. Hey? But I care about his uh, Inuk father very much. And he's the one that comes most uh, in my mind. But his European father, American father, I'll never know who that is. Yeah, that's just the way it is. Yeah. Can you speak to the history of uh, residential schools in the Inuit? Can I speak about that? Yes. Yeah, I can. You got the money? <laughs> <laughs> Residential school. I started for Inuit in. Um, can I have some water? <coughs> um, residential school started really for Inuit um, in um, Labrador, Inuit, with Merovian Church 500 years ago. Except they call it uh, boarding school uh, when they came. And um, there were much like the Canadian government, in which the, they took us away from our uh, parents forcibly. And um, when we got to the residential school, we had uh, no um, say about wanting to learn about our own culture and about our own language. That's why when um, a school principal named Chess Sister Chaput caught me speaking in Uktitut with uh, late Marius Kayuta uh, in September of 1968, she said to me, come down. And uh, when I got in front of the class, she said, open your hand. Um, she hit me with the yardstick so hard and said, don't ever let me hear you speak that language again in this classroom. So we were not allowed to speak our language. We were not allowed to speak our, we were not allowed to practice our um, uh, Inuit culture, Inuit language, Inuit traditional beliefs such as shamanism in Chesterfield Inlet, Turkotel Hall, Sir Joseph Bernier Federal Day School. And that was common throughout Federal Day Schools in Northern Quebec, uh, as it was uh, in different parts of the Northwest Territories. In the 1950s, they actually had a tent residential uh, uh, school throughout the whole winter in Kogloktok. In 1950, we got the pictures. Um, uh, whereby uh, these uh, 10 to 15 young men and women were in the tent with the snow bank around it all winter long. That must have been cold, hey? Eh? So residential school, uh, they told us, was to uh, assimilate Inuit into becoming a European. And um, it was a permanent disconnection with, uh, with us, with our parents. When we got back, from the uh, residential school, went home. We were the, never the same people. By our own people, they started, Inuit in Nauyat started calling us uh, little white boys and little white girls because uh, we had changed so much. Uh, it hurt at the time, uh, but that's the reality at that time. Residential school, I spent six years at the residential school, uh, four years at the Roman Catholic Church, and uh, one year in Yellowknife. Um, thank you very much. Well, it took me a while to find. Oh, that's fine. Thank you so much. Mm. So, um, we, as I said, we had a loss of language, loss of culture, loss of uh, 
Inuit traditional beliefs that the shamanism and lots of parenting skill. So a lot of our, uh, going, kind of going back to tell the story, a lot of our intergenerational are um, in prisons, particularly men in southern Canada at federal prisons, as well as in provincial uh, prisons in the south. Eh? So that is the impact of uh, residential school for my generation. We're trying to do something about these things um, from what happened at the residential school. At the residential school, they would come in by plane uh, every fall uh, at the end of August. They bring us to uh, Turkotel Hall. Every May, they would bring us back to our community. At, um, when we got back to our community, we kept our language because we uh, I still speak um, very good Inuktitut because our parents did not speak uh, English. We only spoke Inuktitut when we got back from May, June, July, and part of August. So that was our experience. We learn about seal hunting in the springtime. We learn about uh, bird hunting in the spring. We learn about fishing in the springtime. We learn about uh, um, breaking up ice in the, in the spring and fall time. We learn about rain in the, in the spring, oh, sorry, in the springtime. We learn about rain. We learn about growing uh, berries and birds coming in, picking eggs and things like that. But look, from um, um, September, October, November, December, January, February, March, April, we lost all that winter language. That's the impact of residential school for us Inuit at that, at that time. But uh, today, we're uh, working towards uh, re reclaiming and retrieving and taking back uh, what we've lost at the residential school. Yeah. Does that help you? And the other thing, too, in the 1950s, thank you, uh, Dan. Uh, thank you very much. Have a safe uh, trip back home. At the uh, residential school, uh, we got a lot of uh, catechism. We got a lot of catechism um, instructions from the Roman Catholic Church. Um, we um, went to church all the time. Um, we weren't taught about our culture whatsoever and our language, uh, which was, um, looking back, it was very sad. You know? Also, at the residential school, we, um, they used to feed us uh, frozen cow beef. The reason why they did that was because, um, well, those young boys and girls are Eskimos. They're used to eating raw meat and frozen meat. So we'll feed them cow beef. Cow beef was uh, imported from southern Canada to uh, Chesterfield Inlet so that we could have cow beef in square like this, about this thick didn't taste right, but we had to eat it, eh? But not only that, um, there was a man who uh, fished for a residential school, and um, um, they froze the fish right away without taking the guts out. So the gray nuns, when they, they were our cooks at the residential school. When they cook it, they cut it, they cut it into so many pieces, the Arctic char, and we used to eat Arctic char, boiled meat with guts in it. That used to be horrible. Uh, I still, um, ugh, jeez. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, so huh? With having the gallbladder in it? And yeah, everything. everything. Oh my goodness. Yeah, they cut it in, in pieces like this, you know, I cut the uh, fish when it's frozen. Ah, oh, my goodness. Ooh. Uh -huh. Uh, what about tourism? Tourism? Arctic tourism, yes. Arctic what, tourism? Yeah, how do you feel about that? Let me go back to the history of tourism. In the 1970s, uh, when the tourists start coming into the Arctic, not in so many big numbers, they used to start to take uh, artifacts from out of the um, traditional grave sites, for example. Inuit used to uh, give gifts to the dead of the man's, uh, of the woman's favorite tool, of the man's favorite harpoon, woman's uh, favorite ulu, you know, woman's knife, things like that. Eh? When Inuit buried their people 
uh, traditionally, we used to bury them just by a um, circle of rocks, put the dead person in there, and covered it with uh, caribou skin mm -hmm. or seal skin, for example. That's what we used to do. So Inuit had a custom of giving a gift to the dead of the things that I explained. So some tourists, they come in in those days, uh, they started to take. Some people started taking. And um, so, hey, look, I was a minister of the uh, Department of uh, Economic Development and Tourism during that particular period of time when Inuit said uh, no tourism. And um, I understood. Um, but a lot of uh, tourists, too, they came. I shouldn't say a lot. Some tourists come in, they would buy carvings, soapstone carvings, whalebone carvings, uh, walrus tusk carvings, and things like that. Eh? But they took some of these things away, so we, Inuit were getting angry at some of the tourists. Now, we Inuit are uh, in control of our own tourism um, through a cooperative movement. We have hotels in every community. We have dining facility in every community through the co-op. We have uh, outfitting um, uh, companies run by Inuit. They can take you out on a canoe or a boat and take you out on the land. Uh, see the land, see the water, drink the water, see the animals, see the bowhead and, and animals like that, eh? and go fishing also. Um, my own son, he has his own uh, tourism company that he operates in the summertime. So he takes tourists out on the land. Um, on the other hand, you want to go to a Hulluit, for example. If you want to go to King Knight, if you want to go to a pond inlet, you can have a ride by dog team in the wintertime with Mika Mike, uh, a lady. You know Mika, Mika, eh? OK. Um, you can have a ride on a dog team. You go to Iqaluit, uh, you go to Pan Inlet, you go to Nauyat, you can have a ride on the snowmobile in the Kamutik, in the, in the sled uh, with a box so that you're protected. So you can do all of these things as a tourist. Um, you pay good money to people who operate uh, outfitting services in the communities. On the other hand, I taught tourists on the cruise ship. Um, I did that last summer with my son Ted from uh, Pond Inlet to uh, Greenland. We are uh, in the boat, tourist boat um, cruise ship uh, for 10 days and I was teaching Inuit culture um, all the time. I covered one uh, um, um, custom, another custom tomorrow and another custom the next day and things like that. And I got lots of questions too. Eh? Um, Two summers ago, I was on uh, Princess um, uh, Crystal Serenity, the really big one, from Nome, Alaska to uh, King I, or uh, Cambridge Bay, uh, teaching Inuit culture. And um, that was a heck of a big ship with 1,000 clients. Whoa. Yeah, so one day they had me teaching to 500 people. The next day, a couple of days later, they had me teaching to another 500 people, sometimes with 500 questions, you know? Um, it's a good thing. I'm a very energy, high energy person, and I can answer all of the questions they were asking about uh, Inuit of Nunavut, the Arctic, and explorers, and all these things that happened in my lifetime and previously. So um, it gives me, normally gives me a lot of energy and fun um, talking about Inuit, talking about Inuit culture and history to anyone. Whether I'm here right now in the room, whether I'm at the gas station, <laughs> I'm teaching Inuit culture. You know, it's a really fun thing to do for me. So um, I'd like to see the tourist uh, go home uh, having met and respect the people they meet. Yeah, yeah that's what I want to do. And most of the people, particularly on um, cruise ships uh, that I've been involved in, um, I made quite a lot of friends uh, with, uh, uh, with the people. And um, normally they, uh, much like you, they ask some really good questions. They don't put, put me in the spot. They, they can if they want to, and I'll answer back. <laughs> <laughs>
so I hope that gives you. Yes, so you whether you are in Nunavut or Nunavik, uh, Nunatsiavut, Inuvialuit, you have all these facilities now as a tourist to go into a community. And as long as people agree with you coming in and you respect them as a tourist, they'll respect you back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's uh, uh, by lots of carvings, um, by, um, well, there's some um, regulations that don't allow you to buy um, uh, seal skin products, for example, between um, Canada and the United States, for example, because of the Marine Mammal Act in the United States. Eh? But others um, in Western Europe, you can do that. You can buy uh, seal skin products, for example, and take them back uh, to, your, uh, to your country. Um, I don't mind tourists. Uh, yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. When, um, uh, I, I just uh, have a funny story. Uh, one day, um, when I was a Minister of uh, Economic Development and Tourism, in the Northwest Territories. I just came out of the igloo to ministry <laughs> 10 years before, eh? Uh, so I became a minister in the GNWT in 1975. Economic Development and Tourism, which was a really big department at that time. And um, John Christian was a minister of industry, trade, and commerce in Canada. So we worked together for two years from 1977 to 1978. So one day, um, I said to Jean, come to, uh, come to Northwest Territories. He says, uh, OK, we'll go to the next uh, tourism conference in July of 1978. We'll come to uh, Yellowknife. So at the same meeting, he said, um, Peter, that's what he said. <laughs> Peter, um, White Horse wants me to come to White Horse too. So what we'll do, if you don't mind, is go from White Horse to Yellowknife, and we have meetings at both places. Okay, fair enough. John Christian is a very humorous guy. I once told him, "Are you sure you're not part Inuk?" He said, "No, no, no, no." <laughs> so uh, we're having a meeting in Yellowknife that morning. We started the meeting at 9 o'clock, but the night before, I gave them uh, envelopes of uh, brochures and NWT pins and all these tourism things, right? So um, I gave them all these, uh, I don't know how many stuff he had, about maybe about 15. And then the next morning, we were chairing the meeting. At uh, 12 o'clock, he said, uh, well, Peter, um, we... Uh, had a good time in Yellowknife, even though it was short. Thank you for inviting us to your place last night. We had a great time. And uh, he said, you gave us a lot of things yesterday. Lots of brochures and lots of pins. And now I want to give you something. He reaches down and, uh, underneath the, the table. And he gives me a cap. In front, it said, terrified government. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, uh, Mr. Minister, you uh, think of everything, don't you? <laughs> yeah. You're right about that, he said. <laughs> so tourism is a, can be a good thing as long as people in the Arctic support it, and um, as long as uh, tourists um, um, treat and uh, respect the local uh, people. Uh, that they don't go back to their uh, communities in uh, Canada, in uh, different parts of the world, and talk uh, negatively about the Inuit who they meet. And um, tourism can be a good thing as long as we uh, understand each other. Yeah. But buy lots of carvings when you go to uh, <laughs> Nunavut, Nunavut as a tourist. And uh, yeah, I can't guarantee that you're going to have a great time when you go to Nunavut. As long as you fly Canadian North. Eh? <laughs> Canadian North is owned by Inuit of Nunavut and Inuvialuit. No, your choice. So, what do you think? I think you're fantastic. Huh? So um, let me uh, 
let me uh, take this opportunity now uh, to thank um, Cynthia, to thank uh, Peter, 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 to thank uh, <laughs> Beverly, to thank uh, these kids, to thank you all for coming, to thank Carolyn, my friend, to thank Don St. John. Don St. John? Huh? St. Julian. Julian, right. OK. And to thank all of you for coming. Uh, how many of you are from the community here? Ah, right on. I, I, I really like that a lot. And uh, to thank all of you for coming and uh, give you an opportunity to listen to my words about uh, I just know, I just know that uh, you're going to pronounce, you're going to try to pronounce that tonight when you get home. <laughs> I just, how do I know that? I just know it. And I also know you're going to try to pronounce Inuit You're going to say, if that guy from Nauyat, little guy from Nauyat, Repulse Bay can't say it, I can say it too. <laughs> right? Thank so thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for, for being here. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'd really like to thank uh, you, Peter, for uh, sharing with us tonight and teaching us. And uh, we've um, just learned a little more tonight, but it's been uh, incredibly uh, inspiring, and we appreciate it very much. And we look forward to your next visit back. Um, wow. and, uh, but given that you're such a great friend of Acadia and that you've visited us so many times, um, I have a little gift for you, mm. which allows you to take a little bit of Acadia back mm -hmm. with you, uh, which is a, a print of the University Hall, and um, I hope that's something you can Thank hang you. somewhere suitably mm -hmm. in, in your home or your office and thank you. make you think of us. But thank you so much. Thank you. And Very I know much. that uh, we have a few other people who would like to give okay. you gifts as well. But let's uh, have another round of applause. <laughs> thank, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I can take it uh, while you uh, okay. take the other thing. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Cynthia Alexander, if you don't know, and I want to thank you for coming out tonight. And as you may know, Dr. Irnuk is with us for the next three days. He's spending the week with us, and we're calling this the Friendship Tour. But I need to say to you that this, this Friendship Tour would not be possible without the students at Acadia. It's their intuition and their intellect that says that they are seeking to unlearn and then to learn from <coughs> indigenous elders, Inuit elders, First Nations elders like Dr. Irnok, like Elder Carolyn Landry. And that, that's why we're here tonight. And I think the key, and our president is committed to indigenizing this campus, the key is that we need to follow the lead of our youth. They're the ones who have the courage and the compassion. They're the ones who have the strength and the resilience and who are showing us how to decolonize ourselves. So I know that there are friends throughout this, throughout this evening, old friends like John and Ree, uh, Carolyn Landry, and Graham Dayborn, and so on. And I think that's absolutely crucial, is that we gather together in what is distinctively now an Acadian tradition on this campus, which is to do these campus community events and to welcome you, as our president said, back to the Acadia family. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So on behalf of the community, Tita, welcome back and thank you. And I'm sure everyone this evening has learned a great deal and will take a lot away from. And if you're in Ottawa, take a look for him. He's always around. Okay. Thank you. And from the youth? <laughs> I just wanted to thank you on behalf of the students. Uh, oh. I'm in Dr. Alexander's class, and okay. we've learned a lot from the readings, and this has definitely helped us with uh, furthering okay. our understanding. Thank you. Okay. You have this one. This is oh, wow. Cool. Thank really you. Yeah. <laughs> thank you.
And then given that this is a new spring, an indigenous renaissance, we have a few seeds to thank friends whose trust we have. Mm. Thank you. Morning, Glory. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So if you Thank have you. a little bit of time tomorrow and some inclination, Dr. Irna Pogali by the KCIC in the garden room by the fireplace for fireside chats tomorrow from 11 till 2, very informally. And, uh, and then Thursday he's spending with my class. You can crash my course. It's in the basement of KCIC. <laughs> Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.